Hi, I'm Adam. This is Kevin. And we are Tech Guys Who Invest. This is the place for business people and investors to learn all about investing. We offer a fresh perspective on what it's like to have a day job while investing. And we share lessons learned on our investing journey. Our vision is to educate and entertain you while adding tons of value to your daily commute. Welcome to our show. Welcome, everybody, to this week's episode of the Tech Guys Who Invest podcast, where each week we teach you how to invest wisely and safely. Our next guest, David Van Horn, serves as president and CEO of the PPR Note Company. His chief responsibilities include the oversight of the company's strategic planning, business development, and fundraising functions. Mr. Van Horn's expertise is derived from over 30 years of residential and commercial real estate experience as a licensed Pennsylvania realtor, investor, title company partner, and commercial fundraiser. In addition to his role as president and CEO, Dave's biggest passion is teaching others how to build and preserve wealth. Dave is a co-founder and board member of Strategic Investor Alliance, a purposeful planning and networking group for accredited investors in the Philadelphia area. Dave is also a national speaker, author, and investment blogger on BiggerPockets.com. With his passion for teaching others how to invest, you listeners are going to get tremendous value from this week's episode. So enough from me, and without further ado, here is the episode with David Van Horn. At the time of this recording, we've been podcasting for a little over a year. This is our 59th episode. We absolutely love doing it and couldn't be more grateful for our listeners and supporters. As educators, we have a passion for sharing the knowledge we accumulate, the lessons we acquire from taking action, and the investment tips and strategies from the awesome guests we've had the pleasure of interviewing. We've dedicated each week to teaching you how to invest wisely and safely. We want to thank all of you who listen to our show. As a token of our appreciation, we're working on a gift for you and your friends. It's going to contain five tips from various professional investors, previous guests of ours, that will help you maximize your profits while reducing your risk. We will be releasing our first ebook on Friday, February 28th, 2020. Keep an eye out for it on social media and on our website, tgwipodcast.com. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Tech Guys Who Invest podcast. On this episode, we have Dave Van Horn. He's a president CEO, PPR Notes. He's active on Bigger Pockets. He's written a book on note investing. And Dave Van Horn's podcast episode on note investing was actually the reason and inspiration as to why I got into it. Fun fact. Welcome, Dave. Impressive. <laughs> That's awesome. I don't know how I got into it on Bigger Pockets. They, uh, I was probably the only guy writing about notes. That's probably what happened. So, <laughs> first um, of the market. Yeah, I do do a few other things, but yes, they singled me out. <laughs> cool. Well, we're excited to have you on the show, Dave. So, why don't we kick it off with uh, having you explain to our listeners some of the advantages of note investing relative to other uh, real estate investing, like for example, investing in real property. Well, I, I mean, the first one that comes to mind is that it's really passive, right? And um, although the IRS says real estate investing is passive, um, I think when my property manager is calling me with bed bugs, I don't feel that it's that passive. Right. Um, but uh, notes are truly passive, especially performing notes where they're with a servicer. You're, you know, you're pretty much just collecting payments. Um, I think there's a volume and control advantage where you can scale. Uh, so banks figured that out, that out a long time ago. I'm sure, you know, Bank of America would rather have, you know, 30 million mortgages instead of 30 million properties. Right. Um, it, they're also profitable in various market conditions and they, um, they're also a collateral backed investment. So any time, it, you know, that's kind of what attracted me to it. You know, I've traded options and done different things, but the, the one thing that I liked about it is anytime I could buy something at a discount with a high yield with collateral, um, that was the game changing thing for me. They're also versatile, like almost like anything you can do with a house, you can do with a note. So you can flip it, flip a note, you can rehab a note, you can sell a piece of a note, you can borrow against the note. So a lot of things that you can do with property, you can do with notes. And they're also... Um, you know, an asset backed investment, there's actually a, you know, there's one extra step, but there's a, a piece of real estate behind it. So they're in direct correlation to real estate values. But the, um, and the last one probably is the social um, 
conscious investing kind of th- component where it's you know, sort of like a community stabilization thing when you're uh, doing modifications to keep people in their homes, you know, you're doing everything you can to do that, or you're taking a vacant property and getting it back into the tax rolls and back into society and the community. You know, nobody wants a boarded up house with two feet of grass on their block, right? So Yeah. So that, that social component, and that's what drew me towards it. We were talking about, you can make a return, but you're helping people. And what are the ways, or I guess, what is one of your favorite stories of helping somebody stay in their home as an investor? Oh, wow. um, you know, we don't, there, there are times when, um, you know, I'm not an asset manager today. Um, I, my one partner does oversees all that, but the, there are cases where, um, you know, like a bank would typically foreclose. And there are cases where, if, you know, everybody's doing everything they can, but it, it still doesn't make sense. There's cases where we, we leave them in there anyway, you know, like yeah. that kind of thing. Whereas, um, you know, a typical bank might go ahead with foreclosure in some of those cases. So, you know, we do all kinds of things to forgive that, um, you know, bad things happen to good people. The, the four main reasons people default are um, death, divorce, job loss, and medical. So, you know, bad things can happen to good folks. Uh, right. That's really what it is. So it, there, there's, you know, we have thousands of loans, so it's hard to, <laughs> um, you know, it's like somebody says, uh, who has a good deal this week? Well, you know, it's like, how do you raise your hand to that? Because, you know, they're, you know, we're selling hundreds of houses a year and, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, to couch that a little bit, you know, or it's yeah, more no about problem. a trade to us. How well was that trade? You know? Yeah. Yeah. So Dave, you mentioned a lot of advantages in there I thought were were really attractive. One of them you mentioned was uh, you were just sort of talking about how it's very similar to real property in terms of the advantages and what you can do. And I, I just had a question about um, the tax side of things and without getting super technical or detailed or anything. Yeah. And we know you're not a CPA that. also. Yeah, I'm not a CPA. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> And nor do I want to be. No. <laughs> Are there tax advantages associated with notes like there would be with, say, a, owning a rental house? Well, the answer is it depends, right? But, okay. Uh, really, really, there's no depreciation, right? That's the big one. Um, but you gotcha. can do, you know, you can own a note in your self-directed IRA or a qualified plan. So, and usually it's interest income, right? So you can, or it's a short-term or long-term capital gain if you were to sell that note. You, you know, held it a while. Did you hold it a year and a day? You know, that kind of thing, just like property. Right, okay. Um, but you don't have depreciation in the sense of, you know, it wears out. But, and when it comes to appreciation, it doesn't have it in the true sense of the word. Like, you know, you bought a house for 100000 and then someday, you know, 20 years later, it's worth 200000 or whatever that is. With a note, it, you do have phantom appreciation is what we call it. And that means, you know, I might have bought a loan at a discount and now it's reperforming for a long period of time. So it's seasoned and it, all of a sudden it becomes worth par again. Or it could be a case where, you know, I bought an asset that was partially covered with equity um, and then now equity came back in the marketplace. So now the asset went up in value and I really didn't do anything. Now mm-hmm. it'll never go higher than, you know, what, the, the loan amount was plus any arrears or, you know, back payments or something like that. But, but you bought it at a discount. So there's some neat things. There's some neat characteristics, you know, loans a lot of times are front end loaded with mortgage interest or the modifications front end loaded with interest. Uh, you know, a typical loan in the U S only lasts about five to seven years. And if you look at an amortization schedule, all your interest is in the beginning. Right. So, right. So there, there, there's some plays there in the sense that, um, you know, I can own a, mo- you know, a loan or a new modification and collect payments for a couple of years and then turn around and sell the asset for the same thing I could sell today for, right? Which is kind of a, a unique, you know, spin on things. So there's, there, there are some, I don't want to say strategies, but there are characteristics of ideal times to buy and sell. And then, of course, there's different asset classes. So there's strategies in all the different asset classes of, you know, we deal with primarily uh, first and second mortgages nationwide, you know, one to four family residential type assets. So, okay. um, but there's other asset classes and then there's, so there's multiple strategies within those uh, classes, you know. Yeah, that's a very good point. So when you talk about first and second, what would be the advantages of a first position versus that of a second? <laughs> Um, well, you know, a first position asset, it, it, well, usually there, you can deploy more capital, mm-hmm. uh, today with you're in an up real estate market. So margins are a little tighter. 
um, but you can deploy more money and there's equity in the market today, right? So it's very, I don't want to say predictable. Um, and, you know, you can do very well with that. The, um, and with uh, not, um, junior liens, yep. you can position yourself into a deal with a small amount of money. And, um, you know, it's, uh, I guess you're taking on more risk, but there's more mm -hmm. upside. So it's really about, you know, learning how to manage the risk and the better you are at that. You know, we're, we were fortunate. We kind of came up through the junior lien space and then went into the first mortgage space. So uh, many folks do it the opposite way. We weren't that smart. We did <laughs> the other way. And it had more to do with uh, who was showing the, us the business when we were starting out, that type of thing. So we were just, we didn't know any better, basically. Dave, a lot of our listeners are, they're pretty well paid um, employees and they invest a, a large probably a, a very large percentage of them invest in mutual funds and, and things like that, because that's just what they've been taught. Um, Index but, funds, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and why might it be uh, interesting for them to consider investing in notes? What might you tell someone uh, who mm -hmm. isn't, you know, isn't very familiar with it? Well, it, I mean, it is real estate, so that it has, uh, you know, a real estate backed asset in that in that regard. Um, well, it depends whether you're investing in the actual notes themselves or you're investing in a note fund. So they're different investments. You know, the note fund, you're you know, well diversified, you have limited liability, you're investing in, you are investing in the management team. It's, it's similar to investing in shares of a non-publicly traded stock. Uh, when I Think about, you know, if I compare a note fund to, um, to you know, stocks and bonds, it's probably similar to a bond fund because it's debt, right? Like mm -hmm. It's kind of similar that way. I guess, you know, that people might be able to get their mind around, you know, a pool of uh, mortgages being similar to bonds. Um, right. So, so that's probably, you know, and it's, um, you know, it, it, it is a different market cycle. Like the real estate market moves a little slower than the stock market, that type of thing. Um, so, you know, there's some advantages there. I, I don't think it's, um, you know, it, it can get overvalued. Don't get me wrong, but it, it, it's a different cycle. Right. And then the, um, I don't know, um, the actual notes themselves. Well, then it's similar to investing in real estate. You know, if you have one note and it read defaults, you have a hundred percent default rate. If I have ten notes and one read defaults, I have a ten percent default rate. So you kind of see where that's going. But I think um, when you own the note, you own the asset. So it's you know you're on the hook for that. Now there's advantages. You also can uh, step in and do stuff too, right? You're not, um, you know, so and, and you could end up with a property occasionally, right? So you're just not going to have them all the time, you know? Right. Right. Now, as far as the market, you, you're saying that you're seeing tons of notes come in. That's your business model. How are you seeing the market change? Uh, I guess, what is it? What is your sense on the note market today? You know, when we started, it was an up market. Then we went through obviously a down market <laughs> and equity left a lot of our portfolio. And you, you know, at first we were kind of panicking um, because we had all equity assets and then all of a sudden we didn't have as much equity, right? <laughs> right. Like equity doesn't dictate outcome. And that was the big lesson for us. So when you work through the assets, um, you know, it, what we found out was we were overpaying for equity and we found out we made a lot of our money on partial equity and even no equity assets that we paid very little for. So, um, you know, you could buy a partial equity asset for maybe a third of what an equity asset would cost, but yet you would exit, you know, almost just as many. So you might get out of seven or eight out of 10 instead of nine out of 10, but you, you paid a third of what you normally would pay. Right. So, so it's all relative and it, it, that was the big aha after the downturn. And then, you know, you're back up. Most markets are back to where they were before the crash. So it's like high tide raises all ships. So a lot of times you'll hear people complaining about the you know current up market or something. But what side am I complaining about? Am I complaining that my portfolio just went through the roof and that we're getting great execution on what we sell? Or am I complaining about, you know, margins are a little tighter on what you're buying, you know? So it's, uh, I think the peop the folks that are complaining the most are probably people trying to get into the space at, the, at a, you know, where they're trying to time the market. Kind of. Right. Dave, for those who may not understand what a partial equity asset is or a full equity, could you 
uh, help them with that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, if you had a first mortgage of 100000 the property's worth 120000 That's a normal type of mortgage, you know, for right. 125 maybe. Okay, yeah. The, um, a partial equity would be, you know, it's a $100,000 property. I mean, um, $100,000 first mortgage, and the property's worth 80000 That's a uh, partial equity deal. Okay. Mm. And if you had a junior lien, um, you know, back after the crash, we saw some pretty crazy things where you would see, you know, the house was worth a hundred thousand, had a first mortgage of one hundred and twenty-five, and a second mortgage of fifty. Right. <laughs> Ease. Right. Yeah. And you might buy that asset for a pretty good number, and you know, a lot of it would, believe it or not, it, with junior liens, it depends more about the senior lien status and occupancy. Like, are they current on their first mortgage? Because those assets. You know, perform differently than other ones, you know, so that, that you know, a lot of times um, senior lien status is actually more important than equity when you're buying junior liens, which is a concept for real estate investors, right? right. Interesting. That's hard to get their mind around, right? Yeah. Well, thank you for breaking that down. Now, in terms of when you were doing the actual, you know, note investing, I know that you said you're a little bit far removed for that. What were the common mistakes that either you made or you saw newer investors make? You mean as an asset manager? Yeah, yeah. Investor. I was a note note investor, asset manager, however you want to call it. Um, well, asset managers don't make too many mistakes because they're working somebody else's asset. <laughs> um, the um, biggest mistakes I made as a note investor, um, you know, you got to know your note seller. You know, I've had challenges there before. Um, just as well as you have to know the asset behind the note. Right. You have to know the documents and the note. So it's really education in the space, a little bit of experience. Um, in the beginning, if you don't have any experience, it's, you know, it's, you know, you could be learning how to play the guitar. I'm going to tell you the same thing. You have, you know, practice, go get educated, hang out with other people to play guitar, you know, uh, get a coach or a mentor to teach you the guitar. It's kind of the same thing in any of these in real estate and notes is to, um, you know, shadow someone else's deal, partner with somebody who has more experience, whatever that is to get the, um, you know, you don't have to necessarily put all your money at risk or anything. Right. And, kind of learn what you're doing, learn the ropes. And there's other ways to start out slow. Like you could start out with performing notes or in a note fund. You don't have to, once you venture into non-performing, that's where all, a lot of your liability and compliance and your real experience needs to come into play. Uh, and then what type of assets here are you investing in? Like if you're investing in commercial notes, there's a lot less liability than uh, owner-occupied residential loans, for example. They're heavily regulated, right? So As they should be. As they should be. So, so there's uh, different uh, ways to venture into the business. And, and then also invest in what you know. Like, um, you know, I had a heating and air conditioning guy. Um, years ago, I was out to lunch with him, and I said, hey, did you ever think of financing the heating and air conditioning units? And he goes, oh, there's a company that does that. I said, yeah, I know. You've known that company. And he's like, Oh, I go, well, that is the note business, right? You, you're, you could take a deposit on an air conditioning unit or heating, heating unit and you can um, create a note. And then now and if they don't pay, you can put a mechanics lien on their house and you can get a service contract out of that and increase the value of your business. So you can get into the note business by investing in what you know. You know, I have a dentist buddy in, in Dallas, Texas, did the same thing. He uh, started financing dental work. And then years later, the dental finance business actually became more valuable than his dental practice. So you never know. You never know that um, it do, nobody says you have to do notes exactly the way I'm doing it. You know, it's, yeah. you, you have all kinds of debt out there. You have student loan debt, medical debt, auto debt, you know, just uh, credit card debt. It just goes on and on and on, right? So, How did yeah, that dentist secure the, the, the loan? Well, he didn't. You'd have to go. Okay. Like, <laughs> I'm going to take that crown back. <laughs> it, it's really very similar to, um, you know, credit card debt. You know, a lot of people say that to me about, you know, well, how do, how does, how do companies function without collateral? And it's because it's credit based. And what, what you don't realize is, you know, people go, well, that's risky. There's no collateral. Well, every bank almost in the United States does credit card debt, right? So, they, figure, they know the default rates. It's that simple and they know it's tied to credit. So, they factor that into their cost of doing business. So I, I think people, you know, get a little weirded out or overthink it, but there's plenty of unsecured debt out there in the world, you know? Yeah, that's pretty interesting. And I, I think that's part of the reason for the higher interest rates is right. because there's more risk in that. Right. 
Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, and I don't think a lot of people think about notes as what you just described. So it's really cool to hear you sort of talk through that a little bit. I always tell everybody, you're all in the note business. You just may not know it, right? <laughs> I'm not saying everybody, but for the if you think about it, how many people have credit card debt, auto debt, medical debt, mortgage on their house, student yeah. loan debt? It's a lot of people, right? Yeah, we right. can say pretty safely that most people have one of those or have had that. Well, they're in the note business. They're just on the other side of it, right? <laughs> they're not used to receiving a check or being the bank or buying it at discount. Yeah. When you first got started in the note business, do you recall uh, if you had some mental barriers you had to break through? Was there you know, anything that you really felt like was scary to you and you pushed through it to get where, where I, you are now? I started out in the seller finance side where I would like try to get owner financing on a house I was buying in real estate. And I was an agent and a property manager and owned a total company, all those things, right? But And con- being a contractor too. So I did a lot of different things, but it was kind of what I started to notice was, you know, I would hold a second mortgage when I sold a property to another uh, buddy who was a real estate investor too, you know, that kind of thing at first. And then I was doing the private and hard money Thing. I'd lend fellow contractors deals, you know, money on their deals, either from lines of credit I had or from my qualified plans. And what, what started to happen, I was a property manager at a Remax at the time. And I was like, okay, I'm managing these properties over here, you know, over hundred, you know, hundreds of something units. And over here I have mortgages and I'm like, over here, I'm an inspector. I'm in court every week over here. I'm like, <laughs> I don't have any of that or very little, you know, it's like, it just became very apparent to me. It was like, whoa, this is a no brainer. What am I thinking? (laughs) And I was absolutely on my path to have a hundred properties and and even ventured into commercial real estate had done a lot of, you know, I've been syndicating over 20 years and um, you know, I still do some uh, investing myself, you know, I'm in apartments and multifamily and all kinds of stuff uh, to be honest with you. But, (laughs) but, um, you know, I just, I just, it was a niche that I liked and, uh, I believe it or not, it's, it's crazy as it sounds. Some people sound, say to me that you're in all these different things and really I'm not, I'm everything I do is real estate, um, lending or, uh, insurance related. And I, I've had licenses in all those I've had activities in all those and businesses in all those. So it's not as bizarre. I usually don't deviate, you know, from those things. Like if somebody came to me and said, you know, I don't know, do you want to invest in a nightclub or a restaurant? Or I'd be like, no, I mean, yeah, I, actually I've done that stuff before and lost money. But, <laughs> but I'm like, no, cause these things, these three or four things that I do regularly, I feel good about and I know the space and, and, and I just kind of stay where I stay in my lane a little bit, you know, even though it looks like I'm all over the place, but I'm really not. You know? yeah. yeah. Invest in what you know. I mean, you're, you don't, you don't go to those nightclubs very often, Dave. I mean, I go there. That's an investment too, but <laughs> that's a bad investment as well. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you for sharing that, that mental barriers. You took a step back and said, all right, this is the route that I want to go because I'm not dealing with the headaches. Now it's just different headaches, more debt related headaches, huh? Now I just meditate a lot. Well, I have, <laughs> you know, I have 30, you know, 25, 30 employees typically at any given time. So yeah, they're, they're different kind of, kind of headaches, but <laughs> Now, when you talk about it, you invest in other things and investors can get into the note space and most people are part of the note business. How could you recommend an investor who, let's say, only invests in single family or only invests in multifamily? How could they get started as in becoming a note investor? You know, I, I was that same guy. You know, I was the I was the guy that said, I'm going to buy one house a year. You know, and then I became the guy, I'm going to have 20 free and clear. I was that guy. And then I'm going to have 100 houses. They don't have apartments, multi unit. You know, like I was that same guy. And then I went into mobile home parks and storage centers and new construction, uh, commercial office condos, and you name it. I've done all these things. But it, it kind of, um, you were, I was doing it simultaneously with the note space, you know, because uh, people would lend me money to do my rehabs or I'd lend, you know, you hit a roadblock with the traditional banks sometimes. Right. And, you know, when I really think about it, um, I rarely go to a bank today. I'm, I'm like my own bank, you know, um, we raise significant capital. Uh, we deploy significant capital all without banks. I mean, PPR is pretty significant now. Um, what we raise, you know, it's, it wouldn't be unheard for us to raise 150 million this year, you know? So it's, wow. it's really grown to where it, and it's all private capital, private equity. So, 
there's a, you know, it, it's a unique opportunity out there. I think the internet created that ability uh, sure. before the internet. I don't know how I would have even done this business to, this efficiently. You know what I mean? It would have been yeah. today. I can send someone out to a property almost anywhere in the U S for about $40. Right. Well, I can't drive down the street for $40 myself. Right. So it's, it's become that kind of a world where you're able to scale things and do things that you weren't able to do. I can get photos and data that I can never get, you know, you know, almost instantly. Right. So it's mm -hmm. just a, it's just a much different world today that enables you to do that. And a lot of it is technology. I mean, you, you know, to be honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. That that's excellent. So you're the CEO of a company with multiple employees working for you. Um, how, you know, what kind of, um, what kind of say habits or, uh, or routines do you have that you think helped you kind of grow into that type of leader? Um, and, <laughs> <laughs> um, I got it uh, by default. My other partner said, said no, no, I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, I don't know. That's a, it's a good question. Well, probably cause I, I'm on the capital raising side, sure. I'm on the syndication side and, and that kind of is where you know, it's the chicken or the egg, what's to start with. And it's really the capital that starts the movement, right? And then, you know, I right. pull capital together. My partner, John, goes out and does acquisitions and oversees a lot of that, you know, buying and selling. And then my other partner, Bob, you know, oversees all the asset management activities, surveillance activities, all that, all that type of stuff, all the REO, you know, we have REO as well. So, you know, it's kind of, it, I don't know, it just fell on me at at that point. But I, you are right. I do have a routine. You know, I get up early. I read a lot. I meditate. I exercise. You know, I do all the yeah. same, you know, that you might hear on a, you know, a Tim Ferriss podcast. Yeah. <laughs> but the, uh, um, you, you know, I, I'm sure you, most folks that are um, fairly successful are doing some type of routine. Right. Um, so that, you know, they get more done, basically. Yeah, it's, it's really a, what's the one thing that's going to move the needle? I, I say, right. that, you know, I've had some really good coaches, some high level coaches over the years. And, uh, you know, a lot of it is, you know, what's that one thing that's going to dramatically move the needle in the next six or 12 months in your personal or business life and really honing in on that prioritization, almost like a Gary Keller. Right, like, exactly. That's what I'm thinking when you said that. Yeah, it makes too. everything else, you know, useless or unnecessary or whatever. Um, there's a lot of truth to that. We get caught up in the minutia of where we treat everything equally important and it's really not. And it's really, um, and then getting your teams to do that and your, your folks to do that. Um, you know, we, we follow scaling up, which is similar to EOS type system. So we have, you know, an operating system that the staff works on. So it's really trying to get everybody on the same page and, and moving in the right direction and focusing on the right stuff and trying to get, you know, as much, you know, we're pretty lean and nimble and uh, I think there's advantages, there's disadvantages too, but of course uh, you outsource a lot of things too. You know um, you're kind of, it, it's funny what you outsource and what you insource and how it evolves over time, you know? Yeah. So, you, you know, we're in our 13th year, so okay, um, pretty stable at this stage, you know? Sure. As far as raising capital goes, you've been doing it, you said syndicating over 20 years now. What would be some tips you have for people who are newer that are looking to raise capital? <laughs> um, be honest, tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> um, leave it, you know, it, it's funny you say that. I mean, you know, I walked through a process several years back where we looked at, you know, where did every customer come from kind of, and we worked backwards, you know, and we said, you know, at one point, you know how I call it a visible edge, so to speak, where your right. first hit your website or your telephone or whatever that is. And, you know, how many people are bouncing off? How many people are, you know, coming into the shop and going, I don't want to say through a funnel, but it kind of is. And, you know, we might have had a dozen doorways and I, you, we were pretty much working them all the same, right? Well, we're going here and we're flying there and we're talking there and we're writing this and we're speaking there. You know, you're doing all these things. And, what we discovered was about three out of the 12 were where the, you know, it was like the 80, 20 rule is where right. everybody was coming. And we're like, well, why don't we focus 80% of our business on the, you know, the 20% or the 80% where everybody's coming from. So oh, that's an aha moment. Right. And, but a lot of it is making, um, you know, having your ideal client 
uh, knowing who they are. Um, we had like three levels of, of client. We had three levels of, we, what we did was we adapted three levels of service for three levels of clients. Nice. And we wanted to give good service to the, the appropriate service to the actual different levels. And it, we got a dramatic lift from doing that whole type of process. And, um, you know, I think the customers appreciate it. And, uh, and we were spending the, t- the right time in the right places after that. And I think that had a lot to do with it. But you got to have your ideal clients uh, feel comfortable and confident with you. Uh, I think a lot of it's transparency, um, those types of things. And then I also do some things for the ideal clients that I like to think are unique. Like I, I run a group called um, Strategic Investor Alliance, which is for high net worth folks only. And we have special events for them. And then we record things and we... You know, we do a lot of activities um, basically to create almost like a, I don't want to say a customer for life approach, but it's kind of like that where, right. you know, how would I want to be treated? We, we do believe in customer service. We're, we don't want to be, you know, lending club or, you know, where you, you can only get in touch with somebody if you chat to them or something. And you, hey, is there anything worse than a chat where you have to get off the chat and call anyway? Oh I mean, my goodness. Isn't that enough <laughs> it's so frustrating. Like a needle in your eye or something. <laughs> That defeats the whole purpose. But um, yeah, I just spent an hour on chat and now I have to call in the morning. Um, <laughs> so yeah, no, we, we want to have that personal touch. I think um, everything from, you know, a new investor, we, you know, we'll send a gift. We, you know, we do different things and, and we like to, sometimes it's the little things. If you do a lot of little things right, it adds up to be, you know, big deal maybe. No, I'm, we're not perfect either. So it, I, I do like, uh, to let my staff have some leeway. I, you know, I just had one the other day where a guy was struggling to get through the system. And I was, I was like, well, can he go there on his own? And he's like, yeah, but it's a $60 charge. I said, pay it for him. Just pay. And, he, that, and that, that's what my staff member, he goes, is it, it's okay to just pay it, right? Like, absolutely. We're not going to, you know, get a client upset over a $60 fee. Like, just do it. You know, get it in. Right. It. You know, it's like a Zappo thing, you know. Yeah. Just do what's extra, right, for you the know, and give your give your staff the permission to. My theory is, hey, if you're falling within the core values and you thought you were doing the right thing, that I I can't get mad at you for that. You know, that's, that's silly, right? Yeah. So, Dave, what what is something that you would tell uh, maybe a young person or maybe even your younger self uh, to help get them? moving in the right direction in terms of investing, building their financial intelligence, you know, becoming a, a strong leader like you are one day? <laughs> um, well, there are different things, right? One's taking action, right? So that's, of course. Um, I, th- I think people are afraid of, you know, they're, they're afraid of risk sometimes. Um, and I'm not suggesting people should go out and do, you know, dangerous things or risky things. But I think, I'm more afraid of regret than failure, right? So I don't want to be the guy that's 85 sitting on my front porch going, I wish I had done this and I wish I had done that. I would have rather gone out and done it and fallen completely on my face. And, you know, I've lost, you know, money on on deals before. And, and, you know, I'm I'm looking to run a multi-billion dollar fund, right? We're going to hit a billion in probably less than two years under management, right? Wow. And I don't think you can get to a billion dollar operation without losing money along the way. I was, I was telling somebody that the other day, you know, I probably the biggest hit I've taken on a deal is probably a quarter of a million and people will go, well, that's a lot of money. How did you lose that? Um, but the, I don't know that you could become a billionaire and have not lost a quarter million or whatever. I'm not right. saying you want to do that or try to do that. Right? <laughs> wrong way. I hope you're not thinking I better get off this call. This guy's a loser. <laughs> My point is, um, you, you know, no, no one's trying to lose money at all, but you have to be somewhat of a risk taker. Not everything's going to work out. Um, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, more things work out than don't work out. Of course. But, but I think it's, it's the education you learn from the, some of these uh, hiccups, so to speak. You know, was it a market thing? Was it a bad partner? Was it this? Was it that? And all those things get you to where you end up, at, you know, the overnight success when you finally do have a billion dollar under management or whatever that is, you know, whatever success means to someone. Not that numbers necessarily mean success, you know. Right. Yeah, well, right. when you have those losses, how do you get past it? What's the, I guess the, the self-talk or what do you do? And just quarter million dollars is a lot of money. 
Well, a lot of it's how you respond or react to things um, and how you recover, what your mindset is. I never really look at it as um, a failure. It's more of um, what did I learn along the way type of thing. So for me, it, it's always I, was, I learned something from that. It, what's bad is if you keep repeating those. Things, right? <laughs> so obviously, you don't want to keep doing that. But I think a lot of it is, um, you know, I don't care if you lose a hundred dollars on something, you, you know, you, hopefully you learn from some of those mistakes and, and they can happen to a lot of us. You know, um, we do a lot of things dramatically different today. Um, just from the bad things that happen in the business. Um, you know, whether it was a bad actor, you know, a bad counterparty, you know, today we are run a lot tighter ship from having a bad counterparty 10 years ago or whatever that was, you know what I mean? So those right. types of events, that's what's helping you to tighten up your systems and processes and uh, compliance and things like that. Um, today, uh, you know, when we're vetting investments, a lot of times or, or part partners, I'll use like a service like Prescient, you know, Prescient will do, you know, pretty in-depth background checks on individuals and companies and you know, they have a couple levels of service and they're affordable and a quick turnaround. You know, there's no reason to stick your neck out. Now, could you still lose money from the market or this or that? Yes. So you need to, you know, invest wisely. And like you said, invest in what you know, diversify into a couple areas. Um, you know, I invest in, here's an example. I invest in some commercial notes. They're completely counter cyclical to what PPR does. Right. And they're, they're, it's, um, you know, like a merchant cash advance type thing. And those assets are booming in an up market. PPR booms in a down market. Right. So you might say people might say, hey, that asset class is risky. And I'm like, yeah. And so is the other one. And I'm not that smart. I can't tell you when the next, you know, what the next what day the next recession hits. Right. Right. But I can tell you I'm making money in all markets. <laughs> right. So I, I, I think I've grown past some of that. You know, I don't um, you know, I don't let worry about you know, what's the next election going to do or what's this going to do or what's this new tax law going to do or what are they going to do if they regulate this or that? I kind of more or less respond to things. I don't like, I don't worry about what might happen. Now I'm not foolish about it. I don't, it's not like I don't pay attention at all. I don't want you to think that, but I don't let that be the driver. Um, it's more about how I respond to things sure. than to what those things are, you know? Yeah, that's excellent. Very, very, the very, you know, success minded. And, um, I, yeah, I love that outlook. It, so many people are driven by fear and, and that just slows them down and makes, yeah, they get paralyzed. They don't yeah. want to do anything, you know, they just, and, and believe it or not, not doing anything is a decision, you know? So, yeah, I agree. And you know, that, that is the difference between someone like yourself and, uh, and where Kevin and I are trying to be, and someone who looks at those people and thinks, how can they get there? Like, how can people get to that level? You know, I, th I think that's a big difference. Well, or they're afraid of what people would think. Or, yeah, it's you know, a big one. Like, you know, I'm kind of sticking my neck out there saying, you know, hey, I lost money one time or here or a couple times or there. You know, like, yeah, I'm, I could sit there and go, well, I don't really want people to know that. They'll think less of me. Um, you know, some, you know, was, was some of the things in my control worth some of the things out of my control? Um, and you know, what could I do differently? Well, I would have never learn what I could do differently if I never did it. Exactly. Like if I just sat there and just said, you know, oh, I, I hope is my strategy. I hope something happens. I hope I end up with a good 401k when I go to retire. But you know, I watched my father do that and you know, I watched him lose several hundred thousand in his 401k right after he retired and wow. he had to go back to work at, at age 70 oh, and I don't want that to happen to me, you know, so I'm not going to, you know, live at the whims of someone else. I'm going to take control of my investments and take control of my, uh, you know, outcome and then it's on me, right? I'd rather be on me than someone else. Right? Yeah, exactly. Oh man. Yeah, that's, that's awesome stuff. You so, mentioned a lot of uh, good nuggets there. Sorry, Adam. I, I just yeah. wanted to further clarify when you were talking about how PPR makes money on the downturn and the commercial notes make money uh, the opposite end. Can you expand on that just a little bit for our listeners who don't know? Well, yeah, uh, the commercial notes I'm talking about are um, small business loans uh, to you know small businesses that are backed by receivables, right? So they're really... Um, you know, there are former commercial notes. Um, I do it, uh, you know, similar fund structure where, you know, it's all over the country, multiple different kinds of companies. And, um, 
you know, there isn't a ton of collateral. It's not like it's against the property, right? It's really against, um, you know, inventory, right? So you could say, hey, well, the inventory disappeared. Did you get paid? But it's like anything, there's a default rate, just like there is with, uh, you know, it, it could be like a, cre- you know, credit card debt or, you know, look at Lending Club. You can yeah. get in the note business with $20, $25 by taking a piece of a loan in, in a Lending Club or a Prosper.com. So if some people say, well, does it take a lot of money to get in the note business? No, it's 20 bucks. It's a case of, you know, $25 is a case of beer maybe, right? So it's <laughs> not that much money. So it's really how do you look at that? Um, when I look at PPR, the bulk of our company was built with other people's capital, right? So it, it, I'm not saying we never had any skin in the game. We do. Um, but it, 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 the majority of the company was built with, without our capital, right? So mm-hmm. it, it's not a case where I needed money to build PPR or anything. No, I just needed someone's money, um, but it didn't necessarily have to be, you know, all mine or all my partners, right? Sure. Dave, you wrote a book, Real Estate Investing Notes. Real Are you Estate showing us? Yes. Backwards, probably. But... Excellent. <laughs> Who cares? Tell, <laughs> tell us about that. What was the inspiration for the book? Um, well, a, a little bit of it was, uh, you know, working with bigger pockets. I, you know, was fortunate enough to you know, be a member there early on and, um, you know, was a writer there, wrote a lot of articles, you know, several hundred articles actually. And, um, you know, was asked to be on a podcast, you know, today I'm pretty good friends with all the folks over there, Josh and, and Josh Dworkin and, uh, you know, all their, uh, you know, higher level folks. And, uh, you know, I was just lucky. I was kind of part of it was in the right place at the right time. Um, they must've liked what I wrote about, but, and they asked me to write a book on note investing and, Sort of, it, you know, I kind of told my story from real, you know, really I'm a real estate investor first and will always be. Uh, I like the tax advantages and things like that. But there's things we can do to be more efficient with our capital and more efficient with our properties, and our investments and um, our strategies that, you know, we can make life easier for ourselves. We don't have to own a million properties. We don't have to have a lot of headaches if we don't want to. And over time, I started to look for things that were easier to manage, um, you know, whether that was, you know, multifamily with on-site maintenance and management, or, you know, I invest in everything from ATM machines to life settlements, you know, so I invest in a lot of different things. And I think um, just, you know, a lot of the strategy, especially today is based on uh, timelines. I have short-term, mid-term, long-term things. I have liquid things. I have illiquid things. I have cash, things that cash flow. I have things that appreciate. You know, I, I have a mix of a lot of different things that I like, um, but they all tend to have their roots in in, in something that I'm familiar with, right? So. Fantastic. So, Dave, you also host a real estate summit. What was the inspiration behind that? Um, well, actually, I actually have a, a friend from Bigger Pockets, Jay Martin, who runs one in in the San Francisco Bay Area. And, uh, he, I I don't know what made me go out there. He asked me when he first did it, he goes, Hey, will you come out here and talk about notes? And I was like, who is this guy at first? But, (laughs) um, I did it. And then, you know, the thing took off and it was a a unique event because there was really no guru gurus or selling anything at the back of the room type thing. And, um, you know, I went out there and he, he did, he was doing it for charity for an orphanage in uh, Vietnam. And I, you know, kind of took that inspiration back to Philadelphia and said, yeah, I'm going to do this. Well, first I asked him, would he do it on the East Coast? He said, no, it's too much work. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, you know, that was part of the inspiration. And, um, and then it was a combination. You know, I run that high net worth group. Basically, that group works like a, a Yelp. It's like an invite only for high net worth folks. And we share resources, right? We share advisors. We share alternative investment strategies. And what I did was I was like, well, you know what, maybe I'll bring that concept to the masses at this summit and I'll, you know, come in and kind of cover a lot of these same ideas that we do in the high net worth group. You know, I, nothing would make me happier than to take uh, folks who were like not accredited and help them show them the way to become accredited. Right. Because, you know, I was a very, um, I didn't have a lot of opportunity as a young person. I was raised by a single mom with six kids, you know, so we were, you know, we grew up on assistance and things like that. And today, obviously, I do pretty well. So it was kind of like, you know, I kind of know what that takes to 
you know, how did I come from, you know, how do you go from assistance to being a high net worth, uh, you know, individual and, and, you know, it does take some effort and some, you know, some things along the way. And, and if I can guide someone else or show someone else, uh, some ways, and a lot of it is network, it, you mm-hmm. know, you're, it's not always just education. You know, a lot of people think, you know, well, if I go here, you know, sure you can, I'm not saying you don't buy an, uh, a network at Stanford. I'm, I'm not trying to, uh, <laughs> I'm not a fool, but, the, <laughs> at, but at the same time, it, it's more than that. You know, I, I didn't go to a fancy school. I went to a state college, you know, I didn't have a super high level degree. You know, I only have a bachelor's degree, but yet I've done pretty well. So I think there's, um, more than one road that people can take and, uh, and do very well. And, um, you know, I have a couple of friends that, you know, just, you know, went to high school and I have one buddy didn't even finish high school who is a multi multi millionaire. So I don't know that that always indicates outcome, you know, um, it, it, I think there's other drivers sometimes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. That, I love some of the ideas you talked about there. I, Kevin and I both just really, um, we feel like what we've learned in the last few years, ha- it's almost like we're looking at life through a different lens. And it's somewhat profound to us that everyone doesn't know this stuff. And, and I'm talking about things like that growth mindset, that abundance mindset, the wealth, the way wealthy people think. And when you first find out about it, it's still fresh enough where I feel this way a lot. Like, is this real? I mean, is this a thing? And then every time I talk to someone like yourself, uh, I, I'm reminded it is. It's just a different way that most people don't know to look at things. So when you said bringing some of those concepts to folks who otherwise don't have access to it, I'd just love to hear that. It's, it's fantastic. <laughs> well, it's like an entrepreneur mindset too, or, you know, if you think about 95% of the people trade time for money, right? Right. Whereas 5% trade money for results yeah you know so it's it's a different mindset it is totally huge, different huge right? shift, totally different yeah. mindset so it's um you know how do what are you going to leverage in the next six to 12 months is another good you know you know i was saying earlier what's the one thing it's what can you leverage in your life right now could you leverage technology could you leverage human capital could you leverage uh you know there's a lot of things education could you leverage you know, there's a lot of things that we could leverage in the next six to 12 months that could be one of the main things that really change things dramatically. You know, I could leverage a JV partner. I'm literally working on the biggest deal of my life. Right so, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things you could, um, but you got to be ready to receive it, right? It's kind of yes. like uh, opportunities can come past you, right? And they'll just keep on going. But if you're not ready to receive it, it's almost like a spiritual thing, right? Are you? Are you ready to receive it today? It really is. (laughs) But if you're not ready, it's just going to float on by. So it's kind of working on yourself. You know, I'm a big Jim Rohn follower, you know, um, you know, work harder on yourself than you do on your job type stuff, you know? And, oh uh, yeah. 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 That's fantastic. Okay. Uh, one, (laughs) one last question here. Uh, we, we'd love to know what your thoughts are on the market. It's pretty clear to most people that we're at the top of a cycle, you know, we've been in this up cycle for longer than we yeah. normally see in cycles. Uh, you know, what are your thoughts on that? How are you looking at that? And, and what might you be doing right now to sort of prepare for where we are? You know, it's funny you say that. There's, um, I have one good friend who, um, you know, has an economics background and he, he tries to time the market. And then I have another friend who doesn't time the market <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out who I want to be going forward. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time up until now, I've been a guy that likes to think of himself as prepared all the time. And, it, you know, for a while I was, I was teaching a little bit about recession proofing your investing strategy. And really what, the main gist of that talk is you should be ready for a recession all the time. So if you set up your stuff, it it becomes irrelevant, right? So, you know, I, I have things that aren't tied to the market. They're not not tied to real estate market and they're not tied to the stock market. So how many people have those investments? I have investments that aren't tied to my current business. You know, it's like, do you buy stock in the company where you work or whatever? You got to You got to think about, um, 
there's plenty of businesses that take off in recessions, right? So I think of some of those, right? Like look at PPR. PPR, you know, people say to me, well, what's PPR going to do in a recession? I'm like, are you kidding? You realize what we buy, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> we buy distressed assets. If there's a recession, you know, our, the biggest driver for our, our organization would be jobs, right? So if the economy and jobs tank, you know, why do you think back in 08, 09, we, we, were, you know, we were having a field day. Um, right. Assets became really cheap, you know, yeah. really cheap, like, and abundant. Like, I look back at, I wish I had some of the assets up in New York, in the five boroughs and in Southern California. I'm like, you know how many assets we blew out the door that we should have held, you know? Yeah. But, you know, you can't kick yourself on too bad <laughs> on some of that stuff. But you get what I mean? Like, so in that regard, it's, you know, I don't want to say bring it on, but it, it's not, it's not really the case. I don't really want to sound like, you know, I, I want to profit from a down economy or anything like that. But you, there are definitely uh, certain industries that do well in certain types of uh, up market or down market. There's, there's yeah. definitely some industries that benefit, um, you know, in a down market or a recession proof. Like I have a good friend who just opened a business that is insurance related. And it's tied to catastrophes and things and has nothing to do with the market. It has to do with the next hurricane or whatever. So it has, you know, uh, there's businesses out there that are definitely recession proof that uh, people could think about for sure. Yeah. yeah interesting. And then, then it's Good. also about reserves, access yeah. to cash, um, maximizing your cash flows, maybe right. fixing and refi and some of your rates. Basically you kind of, you know, read the writing on the wall. Like you said, it will be a year from now, two years from now. You know, I'm not that smart. I don't know that I need to be that smart. Um, I can just basically be prepared and always have access to cash and always have, you know, the best cash flow and always have the best rates. You know, like one of, one of my recent strategies where, you know, deals are hard to find sometimes in, in an up market like now. Yeah. So one of my strategies this is going to sound a little bizarre, but I, me and my family, some of my family members are paying each other's mortgages off on their investment properties. And basically we're charging each other like 7% interest only. And we're just doing it for each other. And we're getting rid of our Wells Fargo loans and things like that. And we're just paying each other. And then the extra cash flow we're making because we have interest only payments with the extra cash flow, we're shoving it into insurance contracts. And then the insurance will pay our properties off if anything happens to us, right? So there are strategies out there wow. that you can employ and then I can build up the cash value inside the policy and now it's real safe in there. It gets a little bit of a yield. No one can get at it. They can't sue me or if I go bankrupt, they can't touch that money. Now, if I build up the cash inside the policy, I can borrow it out and pay a house off anytime I want. Right. But, wow. but what's the advantage? And the answer is there's not really not much advantage because if I have 3 million in property and 5 million in insurance, who cares when I pay them off? Right. Like it's silly. So it's the family banking concept. That's what the Rockefellers did. That's what the Vanderbilts didn't do, right? So <laughs> either Vanderbilts are broke or the Rockefellers, because the Rockefellers basically incorporated like a family banking, infinite banking type concepts where you can, um, you know, why think about your family, how everybody has a mortgage and they're all paying Wells Fargo. I'm just using them as an example, but uh -huh. not to pick on Wells. Uh, but they, they we're that. all paying a regular bank when we could all be paying each other loans, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah, we all have money in our retirement accounts. And we all have mortgages. Like, hey, did we ever think that we could uh, be each other's bank? And, you know, have, I'm not saying, you know, whether you're family, you know, financial family or financial friends, you, it works the same way. Um, That's but, you know, point. those types of simple concepts are, you know, oh, I'm having trouble finding a deal. Well, you know what? Maybe I'll pay off one of my rentals and you pay off one of mine. I'll pay off one of yours. And, um, you yeah, know, I just did. I, I literally did four mortgages today for a, fam a family thing. Yeah. That is something I've never heard of and I never would have thought about. So that's really interesting that you, you bring that up. But yeah, ultimately, like if you can't find a deal, why, why not get rid of some debt? Not that I love to pay down debt. I'm usually in accumulation mode. But I'm, yeah. I'm approaching a recession. If I, if I get rid of some traditional mortgages and can up my cash flow, if I convert from uh, you know, a p and i payment at a regular bank and go to interest only for 10 years to a relative and they go interest only for 10 years to me, and I don't care what the rate is. We can charge each other whatever we want. Um, and then I can back it, you know, I can, you know, bury some of my extra cash flow into a pile, you know, bury it into policies and things like that. And then it's in a safer bucket and then it's, no one can touch it. It grows inside the policy. If I need to get my hands on it, I borrow it. It's a tax free. So it's, it's just a different way of thinking about some of the stuff. I love That's an example of like that. Yeah. yeah of so staying creative. ready. Very creative. <sighs>
Really cool. Now, the last question we want to ask you, we wouldn't be Tech Guys to Invest if we didn't ask a question about tech. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> so in your daily life as a CEO, what is a piece of tech that really helps you out? Well, uh, yeah, that's funny you say. Yeah, it's my IT guy. It's my department. <laughs> uh, it's your butt down here and fix this. No, I, I mean, it, you know, it's funny. It, it, we use a ton of it, right? So a lot, I, you know, we're a data company, basically. So our data becomes the DNA of our business, right? There's nothing more valuable to us than our data, right? Because we have data on assets from so many years now. You know, we can, we can scrub a pool. We can tell exactly what it is that somebody's trying to tell us. We can tell you exactly what it's worth. We can kind of predict pretty confidently what that's going to, you know, generate over time. So that's a pretty powerful tool that way. Um, we actually have like an, um, an, like an automated value chain model that's internal, that's custom to us, right? It's proprietary, right? So that's probably the big thing. I know over the years, it was, I remember when we first started in the business, you'll love this piece of technology. I was using a magic jack on a laptop and we had no office. I was operating like on the hood of my car and that was my <laughs> 800 number was in the magic jack. People in the car right now, what's a magic jack? But the, <laughs> and um, I don't know, I think, you know, I remember when I was, there was a time when there wasn't much technology. You know, I remember when the beeper came out as a real estate agent. Where I had a <laughs> wow. phone that was like a shoe. And um, <laughs> I remember my first calculator. I was like in fourth grade and I got this thing from, I think it was like Fidelity Bank. It was the Bomar Brain. It was the dumbest calculator you ever saw. All it could do is as of track, multiply, and divide. And I thought that was the thing. And then, you know, of course, Texas Instruments came out with the, you know, the TI-30 or whatever. And... <laughs> You laugh about that, but look where we are today, right? Oh, like, yeah. Uh, the capability just in my phone is this off the wall. Can, you Huge. can hear my heart beating and stuff. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> how did it, you know, it, when you look back to, um, you know, I was thinking about technology I had when we were younger, but when, even, the, even the beeper, and most people are like, what the hell is a beeper? I can <laughs> see the... The show notes now, but we were actually texting on the beeper. I remember like my wife would have a code because it was numbers and it would be like, right. bring home. I go, press this if you want me to bring home bread or milk or whatever, you know, whatever that was at the time, you know, it was kind of like that. And you're like messaging each other with numbers. So really that the beeper was the invention of the text if you think about it. You know? Yeah, no, that's so funny. We did that too. I, I'm old enough to where we had beepers. <laughs> when we were like teenagers and we would put little codes to our friends yeah. so we would know what who who it was because sometimes you'd call from a pay phone right they didn't know Remember the number pay phones? i mean uh that's like a yeah. thing of the past you know yeah totally and uh it's a pay phone i know in real estate the big game changer was the fax machine probably and they're kind of obsolete now, right? But the oh, fact, yeah. you know, it, back then, signed, sealed, and delivered meant something. We were literally driving around at two in the morning getting papers signed, you know, or midnight, or where a fax machine eliminated all that nonsense, right? Oh, so wow, it, yeah. that was a big, big deal as a real estate agent was the fax machine. And then today, it's everything scan, obviously, but, you know. DocuSign. Yeah. I mean, that's so different. Uh, today, our investors, you know, we have a portal. We have DocuSign integrated into it. We have Verify Investor does third-party accreditation to a law firm. It's all automated, all inside one system. All the documents come back. It's just amazing. And then we can upload all the finance. I mean, when I look at what we do today and what the way we syndicated years ago, years ago, we would print out 100 pages in triplicate, mail it to somebody, <laughs> mail a copy back. You know, it was silly. Like, we were killing trees left and right. <laughs> today, it's just like a different world, right? So wow. It, 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 it's come so far when you think about some of the stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. Only on Tech Guys Who Invest will you hear yeah. this kind of conversation. <laughs> it's awesome. Is I that what it. you want to mean? <laughs> I love it. There's so um, many inventions, though. I mean, you really think about the Tech Guys. Um, Wow, we use so much technology now. I mean, just checking out properties, right? Just look right. at the drones and things. I mean, it's just, I don't know where to begin, you know? Yeah, yeah. And some of the apps that allow you to look up real property data as you're driving down the street and all that. It's, it's yeah, I mean, amazing right just now. The pu just getting the public records. I mean, just like MERS doing automated recordings and it's just, there's, it, I don't, it's ripe for some more transformation too, you know, and a lot of the, 
lending, mm-hmm. financial services, you know, all these industries are going to see dramatic changes. I think it's, it's coming. Well, Dave, thanks so much. We've really enjoyed having you on the show. You've added tons of value. Uh, we're, we're so appreciative for you to come on. Can you tell folks uh, where they can find you? Uh, yeah, a couple of places. Uh, probably the easiest is, you know, PPR, noteco, N-O-T-E-C-O.com. Uh, we have a, you could go forward slash resources. We have, you know, an ebook on there and some groups and things like that. We have a distressed mortgages group on LinkedIn. We're always on bigger pockets. We answer questions literally daily. So if you have a note question, you can reach out to us. We will answer you. Um, so those types of places are probably the, some of the best. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah. That's it for this episode of Tech Guys Who Invest. This is Adam. And this is Kevin. Thank you so much for listening to us. Don't forget to join our Facebook page where we're building a community of investors so that we can share ideas, tips, and other ways to help us get out of the rat race. If you found value in this podcast, it would mean the world to us if you could share it with your network. Lastly, we love feedback. It's how we get better. So if you wouldn't mind spending 30 seconds and leaving us an honest review on iTunes or Stitcher or whatever platform you're using, that would be super sweet. If you want to get on Adam or Kevin's calendar, go to tgwipodcast.com slash contact. We want to help you invest safely, wisely, and ultimately get you out of the rat race. Thanks again.